Hello, and welcome back to The Scriptures Are Real. I'm your host, Lamar, and uh, this is my co-host, Kerry Muelstein. Hello. <laughs> and uh, we just finished up talking about the first five books of, we call it the five books of Moses, five books of the Bible, often attributed to Moses as being a, uh, the abridger or the compiler of those books. And now we're going to move into a new phase. This is exciting. We're going to get into Joshua, which is, is um, a new phase, but again, like we mentioned last time the theme is going to remain the same and we're going to get into that but let's let's set up joshua carrie what do we who is joshua and uh and why is he taking over what makes him qualified to take over for moses moses is a big figure he's taken these guys across the desert for a long time a very powerful figure very central yeah. probably one of the biggest prophets that you will ever hear about because he's done so much uh for the children of israel why joshua now? Yeah, Moses really is larger than life in so many ways, even today. But if you can imagine uh, in that day that the prophet who led them out of Israel and the Red Sea and everything else, larger than life, and uh, to not have his leadership. And again, you've got a group of people who have grown up knowing nothing but Moses as a leader. Uh, and uh, to ha not have his leadership, that's a, that's a big void to fill. Yeah. Um, and it's, uh, it's going to be a difficult task and Joshua has really, really big shoes to step into. And so, um, Joshua has been around for a while. He is one of the few people who was an adult when, uh, they first came out of, uh, Egypt and, mm -hmm. and he was with Moses, uh, when they went up on Mount Sinai to talk to God. Uh, I find it interesting. There was a time where Moses and Joshua were in the tabernacle talking with God and, and Moses is sent out to talk to the people, but it says Joshua stayed in there. And I always wondered, so what he and God just so said, well, let's chat for a while. I, yeah, I, I, I kind of still like to talk. Yeah. Hold back. Close the curtain. All right. Let's yeah. talk. About it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, that's kind of seems like something went on there. Right. So I wouldn't uh, doubt it. I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah. Joshua, Joshua's, uh, Joshua has been a guy for a while. He's been Moses's guy, one of his supporters. He's one of the two faithful spies that says, yeah, the guys are big. The walls are big, but God is with us. Let's go do this. Uh, Caleb's the other one. So they're the two adults that are going to come into the promised land. Um, no one else that was an adult and made that choice not to come in gets to come in. So Joshua is one of those guys. Um, and uh, he's from the tribe of Ephraim. I don't think that's insignificant. Uh, this is a I tribe hadn't thought that was, about that. I had not thought about that, but yes. Yeah, they've hmm, been promised uh, leadership roles, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so he's going to yeah to gather the whole earth together, right? So yeah, yeah, and so um, so it's significant that he's from Ephraim. Um, but uh, as I said, Joshua has really big shoes to fill. Uh, and the Lord knows it. So he's going to kind of encourage him. And then he's going to do a few things to help him, uh, Israel, to do this. But let's, let's go to Joshua chapter 1. Okay. And uh, Joshua is given a charge by Moses. We actually got that little hints of this a couple times in Deuteronomy. Um, but it's really specific in Joshua chapter 1. So if we go to Joshua chapter 1, verse 5, um, God says to, to Joshua, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. Now, listen to this. This has to be so comforting to someone who is stepping into to, um, Moses' shoes. I, sometimes I think about how this must have been for Brigham Young, right? To step into yeah. Joseph Smith's shoes. Joseph is also larger than life. Um, and to step into his shoes, there's got to be something like this. So this is what God tells Joshua. As I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. That's got to be the most comforting thing ever. And then he says, I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Now, the next thing he says in verse six is something that's, that's really a repeated theme in what he says to Joshua. Be strong and of a good courage. Uh, and then he tells him he's going to divide the land. And then look at verse seven. Only be thou strong and very courageous. And then that you can serve the law uh, that Moses gave you to do and don't do anything else. And you'll have good success and you'll prosper in verse nine. Have I not commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. And then he gets lots more information, but just to make sure that he's getting the point, let's go to the last verse of the chapter, verse 18. Whosoever he be that doth rebel against thy commandment and will not hearken unto thy words in all that thou commandest him, he shall be put to death. Only be strong 
and of a good courage. So I, I don't know if you're detecting a theme here. But, I think so. Yeah, there, there may be. So. Uh, and so this is to Joshua in a way, it's to all of Israel and in a way it's to us. Um, as Joshua is given a tough job. I mean, it's tough just to go in and conquer the promised land. That's, that's a tough job. It's also tough to get people to follow you when you're not Moses. Right. Uh, and God just keeps telling him, just, just do it, basically. I mean, he could be Nike for all I know, but uh, I mean, it, it says, just, just do it. Just be strong and courageous. I've got your back is basically what he's saying. I'm there with you. I've got your back. You go in and do, and I'll make it happen. I, yeah, and I love he says, I will not fail thee, you know, and that's, that's the message of, of, of faith always to us, like, look, if you do, if you're standing on the right side, if you're doing the right thing, the Lord's not going to fail you. It may not turn out always how you think, but he's not going to fail you, so I, trust in that. Yeah, I so agree, and that's, that's a message for us. Oh, yeah. The Lord asks us to do some things that are tough and to fill some pretty big shoes, uh, and his message is, be strong and have a good courage. I will not fail you. You do what I'm asking you to do, however impossible it seems, however hard it seems, however unlikely it seems that it should be you. You do what I'm asking you to do. I won't fail you. That's, that's right. good stuff. That's great. And that's, that's a perfect um, introduction to who Joshua is. He is uh, he's already proven his mettle. He's proven yeah. his faithfulness. He was he's there led them in battle game. before. Yeah, right. Um, and he's been by him. And so he's, he's, he's a good leader <laughs> from the beginning. He's been a good leader, um, a, as a Lieutenant or a general kind of in, in the, in the armies of Israel, he's been a good leader and he's going to take over. And this is, this is his, the Lord giving him a little pep talk here. Hey, it's yeah. going to be okay. Just be strong and good courage. So how many times is that four, at least four times? Uh, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, five, five. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna mark those more. I didn't grab the one at the end. Well, so, yeah, yeah. So anyway, that's that's a great. That, there's a good introduction to who Joshua is, and and uh, again, like we can always draw our our lessons from the Bible. Um, this applies to us too. If the Lord is the same to you as He was to Joshua and to Moses, if you're gonna follow what He says for you to do, He's gonna make a way and make it possible. Nephi, you know, says yeah. the same thing. Um, I will go and do the things which the Lord commands. For he gives no commandment unto the children of men, save you will prepare a way to accomplish the thing which you commanded them. So, uh, same thing. So, again, the, the, the theme is the same, but uh, but it's great to feel the Lord behind you in whatever situation you're in. And Joshua gets that pep talk from the Lord here. And then the Lord backs it up in an interesting way. He's, he doesn't, so this seems to be a private audience with Joshua, but he's going to say, that as he was with Moses, so he is with Joshua in a, in a pretty big, a you know, writ way. large a, across the sky kind of a thing. <laughs> um, because as he has them actually cross the Jordan yes. uh, to come into the actual land of promise, uh, he has it happen in a way that, that does two things. One, it shows that he really is with Joshua the way he was with Moses. And two, that teaches an incredible symbolic lesson. So let's, right. let's go back to this idea of the archetypal journey and uh, the symbolism of coming into the promised land, which is symbolic of coming into the true promised land or the celestial kingdom, right? right. So God says, all right, let's, this is chapter three. He, he has all of Israel line up behind the Ark of the Covenant. And let's mm -hmm. think again, the Ark of the Covenant, lid of which is called the mercy seat or seat of atonement. So you've got covenant and atonement. The atonement of Jesus Christ is what makes it possible for the covenant to be fulfilled. So if you are keeping covenant, you'll have access to the mercy or atoning sacrifice of Christ, and it will make all of this possible, right? So with that symbolism right. in mind, they march behind the Ark of the Covenant, and there are priests that are, are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, and it's during the flood season. The, the Jordan River is flooded, so it's even bigger than normal. It's not a tremendously big river, but it's even bigger than normal at this time. And I find it... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, you know, I was going to say, yeah, it, it, you're coming down where they're crossing um at the snowfall and when it starts to melt there it can become yeah. a real torrent because you have a big drop between um mount uh Heb um, hermon hermon i want to say hermon but it's hermon yeah. mount hermon dropping down there is a quite a big drop and so where they're crossing can really get flooded i mean it can yeah. really get roaring there in the right in the right season so yep. yeah and that's what it tells us is happening there um 
And I find it interesting that the God doesn't say, okay, uh, have the uh, priest carrying the ark go up to the edge of the Jordan and I'll pass it. Or I mean, I'll, 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 uh, I'll, I'll split part it. it. Yeah. Yeah. He says, just have them start walking in. Get in there. <laughs> and they have to have enough faith, right? So this is different than the group that said, well, we're not going into the promised land because, you know, it's too big for us that needed God to show them once again, he could deliver them before they're going to do anything. He's got a group now that will just start marching into the middle of the river, knowing that at some point God is going to, to uh, split it, right? All right. right. It, that, that's faith. And there's a, so much symbolic lesson here for us to just keep marching until our feet and our ankles and our calves are in the river and, and just believing that before we drown, God parts this thing for us. Uh, as we're following the, the covenant and the mercy seat, and God does part it, and all of Israel marches through on dry ground. And uh, not only is that a tremendous symbolic lesson about God, God's ability to uh, get rid of all the obstacles in our way as we're trying to be celestialized, but uh, it shows the Israelites that indeed God is with Joshua the way he was with Moses. This is Moses's signature miracle, as it were, right? I don't know if right. you have signature miracles, but I think that the, <laughs> the Red Sea was a signature miracle, and it's just happened for Joshua. There's not a better way to, to see, oh, all right, God's yep. still with us. We, this this is going to work out. Right, right. And yeah, like it's not like the Lord's out of miracles, um, yeah. but he uses the same kind of thing. And we'll see this throughout all of time that sometimes miracles are repeated and it's not because someone's copying someone else. So, yeah, so like God because, says, Oh, I don't, I don't know what, uh, I can't think of anything new. Let's just go with an old truth. <laughs> yeah. But the, re the repetition is there for a purpose. Uh, this is like, Hey, just like Moses, this is the new Moses. This is, it's not Moses who held the seat. It, the, the, the office is the prophet. Yeah. And, and it's not so Moses so great. God is the great one. Yeah, Moses did a great job. Not taking anything away from the man of Moses, but God's in charge here, and this is the new. This is God's new guy. Yeah, yeah because in fact, I was misspeaking. Uh, parting the Red Sea is not Moses's miracle; it's well, God's miracle, uh, right? Uh, right. But we yeah. know what you meant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, but I think that it's important to remember that emphasis. That I think you're right. He's saying uh, God is showing. Yeah, I'm still here. You've got yeah. a different guy, but it's still me, and I can still do this. Yeah, the stamp of approval on this on uh, on um, on Joshua here. So, yeah. very good. So that yeah, and and I like what you said is they don't do it. The the, the sea doesn't part until they're in. They're in the water. Yeah, and then it parts. So you got to think of that guy that's on the front of that staff. I'm in the water here. Yeah, I'm in the water here. <laughs> Once again, this so. this is happening soon, isn't it? <laughs> Never really yeah, did learn how to swim. Just so yeah. we're clear here. <laughs> Hope this arc floats. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, but they're in the water, and then the in the water's part, and they come through, and um, and uh, perfect. So this that's a great setup to who uh, Joshua is and why he's important. Yeah. And it's it's kind of a, a a bummer that we don't have more time to spend the Old Testament. Um, yeah, we have a year to do each one of these books of scripture, right? And the Old Testament is big, and a lot of things that happen, and we just bang, bang, bang. Yeah, we're zooming through this stuff. So, yeah, it's it's kind Especially of crazy the, when you think about it. We did like three months on Genesis or something like that, and quite yeah. a bit on Exodus, and then Leviticus got half of a week, and Numbers got a week, and Deuteronomy got a week, and Joshua is going to get a week, and Judges is going to get a week, and uh, I mean, <laughs> we're just like we hit hyperdrive somewhere in here, right? right? We dropped into light speed, and we're going. So. <laughs> that's right, but yeah. but that's good that we can kind of summarize it here. So that's who Joshua is, right? So we yeah. we know who Joshua is, He's and well maybe qualified. I can add there's there's one other yeah. important element with that whole crossing the River Jordan that I don't want to miss because we'll come back to it a couple of times. So you remember right. in, in Deuteronomy, it's funny that I say that you remember in Deuteronomy that one of the great themes is remembering what God has done for you. Yes, so. Uh, God has them take stones, one for each tribe, 12 stones out of the, the bed of the river and set them up so that they can remember what God did for them. Uh, and, and so this is really important that, that God keeps asking us to find ways to remember his delivering power. That's a huge theme we're going to encounter again and again and again. But we're also going to find that this kind of a practice ends up going sideways on them. This is a, a problem with Israel 
they, they will set up stones to help them remember God. They've been told not to, to have carvings or anything like that. So they set up stones and God even tells them in this case, set up a stone to remember what I've done for you. And after a while, those stones start to get worshiped. Um, and so uh, this is the problem. God wants us to remember him and we need to do things that help us remember him. But we also need to be very, very careful that they don't become an object in and of themselves. The temple can even become that. The temple can become a false right. god if if we're not remembering who the temple points us to. Sometimes right. we focus so much on the temple, we forget that it's about Christ. Um, right. Uh, same thing with um, uh, all sorts of things that we establish to help us remember God. Let's not focus uh, uh, on that thing so much that we forget what it was really about. Right. The, the Ark represents, the, the Ark of the Covenant represents the Savior, represents his his power and his presence, but it's not the ark. It's not the ark that's doing it. It's the yeah. power of the priesthood. It's the power of, of, uh, of the savior that does that. The ark is just representation. So that's fine to have representations so yeah. long as we don't worship the presentation. And the same thing with people, the, you know, the, the bishop or whatever, great men, whatever, but it's not the bishop. It's not the stake president. It's not the prophet. It's the power of God that does these things. Although we need the leaders. We definitely need the yeah. leaders and, we, and they're, and they're great men take nothing away from the person, but it's always leads you back to remembering the savior. Whenever we get off that track and make it about the thing, then God or the savior, we start to get off on the wrong path, which I like. We're going to get into Ebenezer the, uh, in Samuel. We're going to talk about that. And one of my favorite, uh, I won't get it. I don't want to blow it all when we get to Samuel, but I, uh, I want to talk about that. It's one of my favorite um, uh, hymns, uh, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Uh, talks about raising an Ebenezer. And yeah. I think that's a great metaphor. I've used it in, in my life, and I think that's awesome. And we'll talk about memorials. But that's what yeah. the point is. The point is, is to do a memorial, something to remind you. It's not, it, there's nothing magical about that. It's the reminder. Yeah. Uh, uh, nothing magical about the stone. Although what's interesting is about the stone, he actually does say here in Joshua, he says, let the stone remember. He, he says it to, as if the stone has yeah. a personality. Um, yeah. And I do the same thing. I like, I tell my students, okay, let, let, let these stones talk to you, right? They can't actually talk, but I feel like they do talk to me sometimes. Yeah. So right. yeah, yeah. You get this personification and yeah, I think this is the first example of an Ebenezer really. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, other, other than the, the stones were in the tribes. That's, I guess that's kind of an Ebenezer, but this yeah. is an Ebenezer. This is the first memorial of, Hey, this, the Lord has brought you across again. We're put this on this big Oak tree. We're going to have this Ebenezer. Anyway, yeah. and we'll have some other ones later on. Um, but that'll be, we'll talk about that more there. But this is a great introduction to Joshua and 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 what we're gonna do. Now, I, I want to kind of transition now. That's the first part. The first part is is setting up who Joshua is and and the people and and them coming into the land. They're coming into the land of promise now. They've been waiting a long time for this. But the land of promise is also populated by uh what we talked about before uh the canaanites right yeah. the canaanites the amorites these people here what's so bad about these guys why do why